Hello everyone, it's me, John Mark Johnson Jr. again, and um, this is, I've made pleas to my Armenian friends <laughs> before on YouTube and other various places, now I'm making pleas to my Calvinist friends. Um, my Armenian friends are usually getting after me for being divisive because I keep posting things about Calvinism, and you know, and... You know, you're unduly uh, dividing uh, people and offending people, and um, you're you're bringing contention into uh, the church that doesn't need to be there, and these kinds of things. And, and frankly, I reject that just because truth is truth, and if you believe that something is true, and um, you actually, and especially when it comes to the Bible, you hold biblical revelation in high esteem, then yeah, you're going to talk about it. You're going to teach it. You're going to preach it. You're going to proclaim it to people. You're going to make sure that they know what the issues are, and you're going to make sure that they have been uh, confronted with uh, what you know to be the truth. Um, that is something that I would expect of everyone, including my Armenian friends. I have no problem uh, with that. Um, you know, that's okay. Um, now, there's sometimes where friends on either side will post stuff and it just gets long and overly involved in things, and um, because of that, I usually end delete those kinds of things just because I don't want to get caught in the middle of an argument right then and there. But I don't mind the opposition. Um, the Church of God should be a place where people contend fiercely for the truth. Um, that is the injunctive that we're given in Jude 1.3, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We have an obligation to do that. And so when my Armenian friends say, well, you shouldn't be contentious in church, I'm saying they're saying, you know, what happened, you know, say in the New Testament, when things got out of hand, when people were going awry with doctrine and theology, especially in the writings of Paul, for example, they were rebuked and rebuked fiercely. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't the intention of reconciliation, that they suddenly considered this person, uh, depending on the situation, that they considered this person to be, you know, not someone who could be a member of the elect, but they did at the same time recognize that there needed to be rebuke and that either, you know, there needed to be a, a coming to, uh, together there or a parting of ways. And then there's also a distinction between essential and non-essential kinds of items as well. You have Paul and Barnabas splitting up and they're still, they're both Christians, but they did split up. They had their disagreements and that's okay. Was it appropriate that that happened? Was it good that that happened? No, not really. We don't celebrate disunity when it happens, but at the same time, we recognize that it didn't jeopardize either one's salvation. We're not giving anything in scripture that would uh, confirm that, you know, Barnabas did not die as a Christian, something like that. Uh, we don't have any evidence of that. So on one hand, the Armenians say, you know, I'm, I'm being too divisive. And then uh, on the other side, I get the Calvinists, my Calvinist friends who say that, you know, I'm, I'm being too uh, loving, too unifying whenever I say that, you know, Armenians can be Christians too. And there's like, no because they don't have proper theology. And if you don't have proper theology, then you can't be a good Christian. I mean, what do you tell the people who live in some of these places where they don't even have one page of the Bible sometimes? They're taught very, 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 very little. But when you look at the issue of regeneration, that is, um, have their lives be, uh, been regenerated? Are they producing the fruit that is in keeping with that regeneration? Because that's how Christ says you'll know them. You'll know them by their fruit. Um, as Paul says, we are to test ourselves when it comes to this. Um, you know, if they, you know, if they are uh, producing all the fruit of being regenerated, then how are we to condemn them? That is, do they love the Word of God and do they seek it out as, uh, as uh, in accordance with what they have available uh, to them? I mean, if they can't search it out with accordance with what's not available to them, are they going uh, to? You know, grow and develop. Do they seek to grow and develop? Are they mortifying uh, the flesh? These kinds of uh, things. And if the answer is yes, then there's no reason to believe that God is not sanctifying them. Okay, that wouldn't be our place uh, to judge on that one. Okay, just because someone ha does not have perfect doctrine and theology does not make them not a member of the elect. Um, yes, that <laughs> doesn't mean that we allow people to get away with theological murder. Okay, we do confront people on what the truth is.
Okay. And when necessary, yes, we do even put them out of uh, the church if the disagreement is strong enough. Okay, if they're preaching something that is obviously not biblical, that is damaging um, uh, the, the gospel, those kinds of things, yeah, we have to act on that. But if we make theological perfection the requirements of church membership, and especially of salvation, then guess what? No one's going to be saved and no one's going to be a member of the church because I can guarantee you that your doctrine and theology isn't correct. Not in every aspect. Just like mine is not correct. At least not in every aspect. If we cannot make allowances for human frailty and for the imprecision of human understanding, then we make the gospel of no effect. For a Reformed person, salvation is entirely contingent upon God. It's not contingent upon us. It's not contingent upon our will. It's not contingent upon our good works. And it's not contingent upon our good doctrine and theology. Okay. Now, so what does that mean? What it means is that someone who is an Armenian can be saved despite their best efforts. You can be saved despite yourselves. And there are even going to be some Calvinists who are saved despite their arrogance. Yes, I just said that. Because a lot of my Calvinist friends are indeed arrogant when it comes to this. You have to have perfect doctrine and theology. And if you don't accept it after it's been presented to you, then that means that you must not be one of the elect. Heaven forbid that maybe they should change their mind at a later point. Okay, who are you to say whether or not they were uh, regenerated when they came uh, to Christ as their Savior? If they came to Christ as their Savior, putting their uh, faith and trust in him, now, granted, they might not fully realize what that means, because uh, human frailty means we're going to be limited, those kinds of things. But if they came to Christ... Uh, as their Lord and Savior, recognizing the need for repentance, the holiness of God, and the abject futility of mankind, and that Christ is the only way. Okay, and like I said, if they are bearing fruit in keeping with repentance, they're bearing the fruit of regeneration, then I have absolutely no reason to call their salvation into question. I'm not going to base their salvation, uh, I'm not going to make their salvation based uh, contingent upon their understanding of Romans 9. Okay. People have had some misunderstandings about what Scripture says over the years. Okay, It happens okay. because we're human and we have human frailties. You can't, you don't want to, okay. no one would survive if your requirement was perfection or if you isolated it to your particular pet peeves. Now, am I saying that anyone can be a Christian? Yes and no. That is, there are some people who are who would call themselves Catholics who we're going to see in heaven. And they're going to be in heaven despite what their church teaches them, not because of it. Okay, Because they came to an understanding of Christ from the Bible that would, did not accord with what their church taught. And they're going to be saved in spite of the best efforts of their priests and the Pope and all those kinds of things. And same thing with some Mormons are probably going to be in heaven as well. They're not going to be in heaven because of what the Mormon church teaches them. Okay. They're going to be in heaven despite that. Now, does that mean that they're going to have perfect doctrine and theology getting into heaven, especially not out of coming out of Mormonism? No. But does it mean that it is possible in so much as it depends on God's work and not ours? Yeah. Now, does that mean that categories of truth don't exist? Of course not. That's not what I'm saying. Yes, Calvinism is correct. Not hyper-Calvinism, but Calvinism is correct. Okay. It is indeed a very uh, much so biblical uh, systemization of uh, God's sovereignty and man's culpability before God. It is an entirely consistent schema. It doesn't mean, okay, I don't believe for a second that it's wrong, and I will continue on YouTube and Facebook and such places to tout Calvinism. At the same time, though, I'm not going to throw my Armenian friends under the bus and say that just because their understanding isn't exactly like mine, that that means that they cannot be saved. Okay? Your understanding of Romans 9 is not the basis of salvation. Christ's completed work on the cross is. And if you dispute that, you can take that up with him. You know, the one who said it is finished. Thank you for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, including my Armenian friends and my Calvinist friends, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, 
I pray that you would come to an understanding of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.